Good evening, folks. Welcome back to Plateau TV. We are still winding our way through the epic first season of Lost. I, Eric, and thou, Jay. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Good, man. Doing, uh, doing well. Yes. Looking forward to this show. I yeah I have been I've been living vicariously through you. I love getting your uh, your messages during the week about <laughs> the, various, the various plot points that spill out and <laughs> hearing your reactions. Um, just as a reminder for folks, um, I have seen Lost many times, all the way through. I think it's maybe five times now, and wow. then. There are episodes that I've seen throughout the show multiple times because when I used to watch the show live, sometimes like I would tune in the way it used to be on ABC is the show would air and like they'd air the previous week's episode at like eight o'clock and then the new episode would be on at like nine o'clock. Um, also, just sometimes watching the DVDs between seasons, so probably more than five times, but. In terms of like my all the way through count, I think it's it's that. But um, so I have seen it. Jay has not, and he's been doing a real good job of staying spoiler free. Isn't that right? Jay? I'm trying, man. <laughs> it's I, I normally I wouldn't be so militant about it, but honestly, and I won't I won't relay the whole story because um, it's you know it would spoil some things for you, but. There was a there was like a Paley Center uh, Lost session, which you should not watch yet. Uh, but in it, um, someone was asking one of the actors like how they how they play certain things. Like, do they get information from like the, the director or the writers or like sometimes they're being asked to play like ambiguous things without knowing like what's going to happen next. And, you know, the actor just kind of said, like, you know, no, I think I think the director usually gives me um, enough direction. I, and, and, and then also, like, like just reading the scripts, like the scripts, like, if I just sort of do what they say, like, I usually find my way. Mm -hmm. And Lindelof chimed in. And, again, I won't give the full content of what he said because it's, it's a spoiler. But he basically said, like, you know... Sometimes, too, it's easier for the actor to do that, to, like, follow the scripts and take the journey with us. Because, like, if we had sat this person down and sort of said, like, okay, right now, this is what's going on. But here's this other thing. And, oh, we haven't introduced this other guy yet, but you're actually doing this. And here's the, like, it's like, you, it would sound stupid. <laughs> Whereas if you organically get to it, it ultimately... Like it makes it makes sense if you go along the journey, and so that would be my 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 attempt to convince you to stay spoiler free as possible. Is that I think if you were to read some of the spoilers that are out there, like out of context, they probably do sound kind of stupid. <laughs> if you if you realize them in the show, though, like it, I actually feel like it, it kind of you know it all kind of makes sense. Like you get something right. so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I have a feeling that it definitely wouldn't have the same payoff if I, yeah. you know, spoiled. Yeah. Well, keep the faith, my friend, and um, let's uh, let's keep you going. I am, of course, joined by my uh, Lost, the official episode guide from the Lost Complete series set, which we'll use to summarize the episodes we're talking about this week, which, reminder, are Homecoming... Outlaws, in translation. I always love it when shows do that. So this the show is called Lost. The Lost in translation. It's uh, it's Lost. In anyway, <laughs> uh, numbers, Deus Ex Machina, and Do No Harm. And as we walk through, we'll talk about who is the focus of that particular episode from from a flashback uh, perspective. But and as just as we as we always do. Jay, what's uh, what's kind of your gut reaction after watching these these six episodes? What's kind of your first impressions? Jared? Well, you know, um, it's our first uh, time to lose one of the main cast members, so um, that's right. It really, you know, took me by surprise. So I uh, was not expecting that at all. So 
Um, but that's right. Yeah, got got a little information on Jen. Got some information on Hurley. So I'm, um, you know, forming these these characters now. So that's right. And in fact, I do believe with those two episodes, the entire main cast now has had at least one flashback episode. And so you know, you know, you may not know in all cases, like I think you know for most of the characters why they're in Australia. Um, I actually think in the case of Saeed, that's in the next, that may be coming up for you. I don't know that his, his reason to be in Australia yeah. has been revealed, but, but at the very least, every main cast member has had a flashback episode kind of telling you who these people are, what are some of their secrets, like what's, what do they have going on? So, well, yeah, I mean, we, we know why Shannon was in Australia and why she was on the plane, but we don't, she hasn't really gotten her own backstory yet. That right. Was she was Shannon's perspective. That's a good point um, that Shannon – that's actually a really good point. That was really more of a boon flashback. Mm -hmm. Shannon was part of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't really sh Shannon-centric, if, you know, if I can call it that. Um, that's actually a really good point. Um, but that did reveal, like, through Boone's flashback – all the things we've sort of been asking about these characters we have learned. Like we know why Shannon was in Australia. You know, we know kind of her backstory with Boone. They're actually not, they're like step siblings. Um, you know, they did the nasty, <laughs> those, those sorts of things. Um, but, but other than, other than kind of the big, you know, the big event regarding, you know, losing a member of the cast, was there, was there anything else that struck you in this bundle? Like, like you say, we finally got kind of a download on, on Hurley and Jin. Yeah. Anything there that you found particularly interesting or? Um, I'm coming to like Jin a little more now that, you know, he's being fleshed out a little more and yeah. I really like Hurley. Um, I, I, you know, he, they kind of play him for the you know, uh, comedic relief most right. of the time. And, um, we got some, some more backstory on Locke, which really just makes his story that much more sad and, Seeing him with it's, hair freaks me out, man. It reminds me of the stepfather. Like, yeah, he, yeah, that's actually, that's actually a funny, a good reference because, and there's also there's also a joke that, um, well, I do I just remember that some of the wigs that the cast wear sometimes throughout the show, like the the people who would cover the show, like like Jeff Jensen from EW, and uh, like Kristen DeSantos uh, from. I think she's, uh, I don't know if she was always at E! Online, but they were two of the big kind of entertainment people who would always like do a recap every week. And I always remember them joking about like the wigs. And so I don't think we've seen Jack in a wig yet, but Jack does have like a wig that's very much like his Party of Five era. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's an awesome one. Um, but by the way, and, yeah, and when we get to it, we can talk more about it. But um, absolutely, that, that lock episode is... Like that's at the top of my my all time favorite lost episodes, but but to your point, like he like Locke's story is is simultaneously like like awesome in an interesting way, but yes, deeply deeply sad and and truly like an acting. I think I'm biased. I've already admitted this. I love Terry O'Quinn. I love the character of John Locke, but you know an acting tour de force for Terry O'Quinn. Like he has a lot of meat on the bone. And he's dealing with some complex stuff, and he is. It's. I think it's incredible. Like I, I, I can watch that episode knowing all the details about it, and I'm still like, you know, a little choked up when I get to the end of that. That yeah. every time, and and it's all Terry O'Quinn. Um, exactly. So what would be so? The other thing we do every week is um, Jay's predictions. Do you have any predictions, Jay, for the future based on the episodes that you have seen? Or sorry, are we all, was it predictions from the previous batch to see if they paid off in these, or are we doing predictions based off of what you just watched? I always get, I always get. It's before, um, you know, before I start watching these episodes, I make these. Got it. Okay. So what are your predictions then? I, I think I got some of these right, but I think some are kind of obvious as well, but. Um, okay. So Sawyer, I said 
looking for the original Sawyer in Australia. Right. I guess that's why he was there, and I was right about that, but I think that was kind of obvious. Uh, yeah. Hurley, I, I was way off here. Uh, Hurley, I said, I was going to say nurse, but it was established early on that he was not very smart. I said maybe, <laughs> maybe an right. orderly hospital. Um, and he's, I said he's very close to his mother, and I think that was right. Yeah, that's fair. I'd give you that one. Uh, Saeed, I said dishonorable discharge from the military. He refused to do something he was ordered to do. And I still don't know about him yet. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten. We we know we know like we sort of see why how Saeed was a like that he was a torturer. We got an identification of the woman in the photograph he keeps looking at, but there's still open question. As I said, we still don't know why Saeed was in Australia. There's some other things we don't know about him. But and Boone, I just said there's something weird going on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Michael, I said maybe his ex-wife intentionally kept him from Walt because of the powers and Michael may have powers too. Hmm. That's I was, interesting. You know, maybe that's why she was so forceful in keeping, you know, she basically ran away with his son. Yeah. And, you know, said this is what I'm doing. So I don't know. I was just kind of guessing there. It's interesting. And Ethan, I said, rest in pieces. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Walt, I said all the weird stuff going on, um, including the monster, are generated by Walt. Just guessing there. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. That's interesting. Um, before we uh, before we dive into the first episode, Homecoming, of which uh, you, you just made a, a reference to it there, um, were there any characters that jumped out at you in this bundle of episodes? Anybody that... Um, like for well, for example, I think you already mentioned Jin. Like you know, Jin is kind of starting to like him a little more. Maybe other than Jin, did anybody catch your attention or, or show you something different in this in this bunch of episodes? Um, probably Hurley, just because you know we hadn't really heard a lot about him personally. You know, right? Uh, he's just kind of been in the you know background, taking orders essentially. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Well. Um, so the first episode, and I and I was and I hoped, I figured that you'd be waiting to jump back in because the last bundle of episodes ended with the Michael kind of Walt centric episode special, where at the end, Claire comes back out of the jung jungle. And just a reminder for folks: remember, Claire had been abducted by Ethan, who as it was discovered, was not actually on the plane with the survivors. So he was already on the island. Um, but Claire came out of the jungle, and so in Homecoming, Claire's back. And this is a Charlie-centric episode. So here Charlie gets a second episode. Um, I would note, just just speaking for myself, and I, want, I definitely want to get your views as a um, kind of new to this, but I, I've, I don't know that I've ever liked – the Charlie flash, like Charlie flash, like the Charlie flashback episodes were never really my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and this one in particular, I just don't it, like usually the flashback story and the Island story, like there's some sort of thematic link or there's something very, like, it seems very much like they're of a piece. And it really just sort of seems like, Here's just something that happened to Charlie one time. Oh, and by the way, on the island, here's the story of what happened after Claire walked out of the, out of the jungle. Um, so, I just those are sort of my initial thoughts on Homecoming that it was not one of my one of my favorites. But how, how did you how that one land with you? <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I, first thing I said was Drive Shaft's music really oh. sucks. Um, <laughs> they keep playing that one song like. You all, everybody, or something like that. Yeah, and it's just man, I, I don't like that song. Well, by the way, it's it's kind of a joke because in, in we actually didn't talk about this, but in the pilot, when they were walking out to the plane, and Charlie and Kate are talking, um, Dominic Monaghan was kind of doing some improvisation, where he's like, "You all, everybody," like. I, 
I don't think that was like technically in the script. I'd have to go back and look. So the pilot script's out there, but he kind of improv that. He made it up, and so then the writers, I think, felt like, oh, okay, it was sort of like a funny joke. Like, okay, well, let's actually write that song. <laughs> let's actually let's actually put that song on the show. And so I agree with you. I don't think it's a particularly good song, but it's. Uh, oh, so he just said, you know, draft Jeff, and he sang a little yeah, bit. You know, you are. Yeah, okay. he just sort of on the spot made up something to, to you know, to kind of add to, uh, <laughs> to add to the scene. I always enjoy that, but it, it might help give you some context for <laughs> for that. Like that, that's why that song kind of keeps coming up. Is that he said it in the pilot, and then I think the writers are kind of trying to be funny. Like yeah. they wrote the song, and it keeps like you'll. It, in, in other people's flashbacks and stuff, like you'll hear it on the radio. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, like that. You'll, you'll have to listen for that. And actually, I did forget. What we usually do is I, I read from the official Lost episode guide that came out of the full series set. So let me quickly do that. After many days, Claire is finally found. I'm oh, sorry. This episode, Homecoming, written by Damon Lindelof. So that's, that's interesting. Um... Claire's finally found. While walking in the jungle, Jin and Charlie are confronted by Ethan Rom, who gives an ultimatum. Bring Claire to him, or one of the islanders will die each day. A trap is set up to catch Ethan using Claire as bait, but when Boone falls asleep on sentry duty, the results are tragic. I That description doesn't quite capture the episode for, for me, really, but I mean, there's nothing wrong. It's just, I don't know if I would can put the episode in that kind of context, but um, yeah, so that's kind of the, that, that's kind of the main driving force in the Island story. Right. So Claire comes back and gosh, she's got amnesia. Yeah. And I was never, I, I, that was always something that like, I kind of buy it in the context of the show, but I don't know. Amnesia stories are always inherently a little, eh. she's um, got it. And conveniently, it only starts after the crash, you know. Right, exactly. Um, right. Prior, you know. um, and so she, but so she can't tell anybody where she was or what happened to her. Um, but meanwhile, yeah, like Ethan shows up and basically says, like, we want her back, bring her back, and nobody gets hurt. Um, and so it kind of becomes. You know, the, the, the Islanders kind of try to close ranks, try to like set up sentries, and um, the big, uh, they, uh, I forget. I'm actually, I'm actually making the mistake of a joke that will persist on the show for some time, but I believe Steve is killed by Ethan of the often named Scott and Steve. Uh, and this isn't much of a spoiler, but I'll tell you, it's like the reason it's funny that I can't remember which is which is that actually becomes kind of a recurring joke on the show is that different people will talk about like, yeah, like when Ethan killed Scott and they're like, dude, he killed Steve Scott's alive. Or again, I might've reversed it. So I might be making that same mistake, but I think you're right. Recurring joke that no one can remember whether it was Scott or Steve who was killed. That's what Curly said at the uh, for like the eulogy. Um, sorry, sorry, I kept calling you Scott all the time. Yes, yeah, that's kind of the beginning of that joke. <laughs> um, but like, I, so well, just a few things. So the the there's there's a there's actually a number of things I wrote down some kind of specialized notes for this episode. One of my favorite Sawyer lines is in this episode. I, I hope you remember it, but. When they come up with the plan, basically, they tried just closing ranks, trying to protect themselves from, from Ethan, protect Claire. But, you know, again, Steve, I think it's Steve, dies. <laughs> um, and uh, they Jack wants to go out and look for him. And Locke's like, what, what has changed? Like, he kicked your ass before. You know, it seems like he knows this island better than we do. Like, what, what's going to make chasing after him now any different than the last time? And so Jack's kind of like, well, I have a case of guns, yeah. which is a secret that Jack was keeping from people. Um, but 
when he goes, they need a they need an extra gunman, and they go to Sawyer. Jack says, "Can you hand, can you handle a gun, or can you handle one of these?" And Sawyer's response is, well, "Hold on, I wanted to, I wanted to write it down to get it exactly right." There's at least one polar bear who thinks so, <laughs> which I've always thought is just such a funny and badass line. All the same, I don't know if you, I don't know yeah. if you know that line at all, but um, there's actually another thing that is worth noting that I kind of wanted to call your attention to because I was looking this up to see if I could find like, footage of it, and there doesn't appear to be it. So you you may or may not have noticed that in the in the jungle confrontation with Ethan. Ethan's kind of limping. Did you catch that, or did it seem like he was walking funny? I didn't notice. Well, I, it's not something I necessarily noticed at first. And the way that that scene is shot is kind of hectic, but he is limping. Like, if you kind of go in and look for it, he's limping. There was a deleted scene that the actual, like, moving footage of it has never been released, but there are, like, snapshots you can get. I can maybe try and find one for you. Um there was a scene deleted where Ethan and Locke fight. Like, before Ethan, re you know, gets to Jack, like, he encounters Locke, and they have a fight, and Locke stabs him in the leg before Ethan, like, knocks him out or knocks him down or something. And so Ethan is has been partially, like, again, it's a deleted scene, so it's not technically in the episode, but, like, Ethan was wounded right before, and that that's why he kind of seems like he has a limp when he uh, is, is fighting Jack in that scene. He, he still looked like really strong to me. Like, was it Charlie? Like lifted up by the throat and like lifted him up against a tree or something. It was someone. Um, but, and then I, he and Jack eventually get into a fight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he actually does get him that time. I guess some yeah. sleep and a meal did it for Jack. Well, that's, See, that was exactly my point when we were talking before. And again, it's not like Ethan wasn't a badass. Like, he still was. You could see that. But this was, this was a Jack who was not like, you know, hadn't just run 10 miles and was running on adrenaline and not sure what the hell's going on. He went out there with a purpose to find him and was running for him. And so under those circumstances, Jack was able to kind of get in a fight with this dude. Um, and then I just, I always, I, I'm, I'm never a fan of like, you know, Charlie shooting Ethan. Again, it, it's one of those things where I just sort of feel it's so convenient that he's been killed, and so now he can't you know, right. tell us anything. Um, I, I just feel like you don't often feel the hands of the writers in Lost all that much. You know, there, there might be people out there who disagree with me, but I feel like a lot of this stuff is organic to the show. But this is an episode... Claire's amnesia, the fact that Charlie kills Ethan, it really feels like I'm feeling like the writers, like, well, well, we can't reveal too much just yet, so Claire's memory's got to be gone, and we got to kill this guy because Saeed's going to kill him. That's just a minor peccadillo, but that's just yeah, know. yeah, I get that. It's it's kind of too convenient. Yeah. But, so, no. Two mysteries that I identified. If you have others, let's let's hear them. But um, it's kind of a continuation of the. It's sort of an evolution of the mystery when Claire was first taken. But what did Ethan do to Claire? You know, where was she, and why did he take her? So that's sort of three questions. But I sort of wrap it into one mystery. Like, what what's the deal? Like, why did Ethan take Claire? Like, what's that all about? Um, yeah. Why did they want her back so desperately? I mean, obviously, probably for the baby, right? So, like, and w where are these people? Who are these people? You know, are they right. affiliated with Danielle? You know, that's right. And that's well, and that's true. Like, so we we've, we've only seen Ethan, but if you remember, when they were originally chasing Ethan, the Locke was finding signs in the jungle that there was more than one person. Although we've only seen Ethan for certain. Um. And then another question, and I don't know whether this occurred to you as a question, but how did Ethan kill Scott or Steve? Uh, seemingly when they had all the perimeters covered, was it just because Boone fell asleep? Somebody voices the theory, wait, did they come out of the water? Yeah. So how did that happen? And it went and it happened unseen. I think that's a question worth asking. 
it seems to be something paranormal going on with Ethan too. I don't know. I don't. I just. Mm. I don't know if it's just the way they're, you know, they're portraying the character or what, but it just feels very odd, you know. Yeah. There's there is something there. I think maybe. Um, but any? Am I missing any mysteries? Was there anything that that showed up in this episode that you're sort of thinking? Well, wait a second. What's the deal with that? I don't think this one. Okay. All right. So I just said, I didn't expect Charlie to shoot him. Um, it's becoming obvious. Charlie has romantic feelings for Claire. <laughs> Is that a, are you picking up on that? <laughs> I mean, I've been picking up on it, but you know, now it's just, you know, they're beating you over the head with it. So, yeah. Um, the next episode written by Drew Goddard, Outlaws, which is a Sawyer-centric episode, as you were alluding to earlier. In the middle of the night, a wild boar steals the tarp that Sawyer has been using for his roof. Sawyer enlists Kate to help him track the boar down, but she takes advantage of this situation by asking for something in return. While Kate and Sawyer hunt down the animal, Charlie's strange behavior causes Hurley to suspect he's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so this is a, this is the second Sawyer episode that we've gotten. And as you noted, this, this episode answers the question, why was Sawyer in Australia? And like, as you said, the answer being, and I think you're right. Like, I think at this point in the show, even the fans probably could have guessed yeah. that he was hunting for the real Sawyer based on the letter and everything. So, uh, that that's why he was in Australia. He had a lead on the what he who he thought was the real Sawyer. And by the way, uh, special guest star Robert Patrick, which is awesome. Yeah, that guy needs to be in more stuff, to my mind. Um, but yeah. Oh, also, let's see. Hold on, I have a couple notes on this one for you. I don't know whether you. Oh, the note is not until later, but. Um, Sawyer was with a girl in this episode before Robert Patrick interrupts them. I'm just going to put a pin in that. Let's talk about that later. Um, the other sort of significant thing that happens in Outlaws, well, there's some good character stuff in this episode, right? Mm -hmm. Like Kate and Sawyer go out in the jungle. They're looking for this boar, and uh, they play a game of Never Have I Ever feels that she's been married before, which is interesting because Kate's like 20. I mean, she's not – the show I don't think ever – I'm sure her birthday is listed somewhere on the show, but like she's not old. It's interesting that she's been married. Um, Didn't last long. Yeah, and they, they're kind of like – you know, they start attacking each other with the questions, which is sort of interesting. You know, Kate and Sawyer have kind of an interesting uh, – inter and then also um, Locke shows up, um, and that's just another example of I really love that scene with Terry O'Quinn because he's in the middle of telling a story. Sawyer explains what's happening. Basically, the wild boar rips his tent apart, and he feels like the boar is tormenting him yeah. or something else going on there. And so Locke tells a story, and in the middle of his story, he's like making them coffee. And that's the one thing that was a joke somebody made about the show – uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it to you, but I definitely mentioned it to my wife where it was sort of like the most unrealistic thing about Lost is that like after they've been on the island for a month, everybody's not suffering horrible, horrible caffeine headaches. <laughs> they haven't had coffee in a month. Um, so it's, I just, I always remember that when I see the scene where Locke makes coffee, like he found coffee from the airplane. Um, but Locke tells a story about how, you know, they had a, uh, he had a, a, a foster sister. So you're kind of getting a little more backstory on Locke. Like he lived in foster homes, but his foster sister died and his foster mom was just torn to pieces by it, which, you know, of course. Um, and there was this dog that just started coming into their house. The implication being that the dog might somehow maybe have like the spirit of, his dead foster sister. Mm -hmm. Locke didn't seem to fully buy in on that, or at least he didn't act like he did, but kind of just telling Sawyer that like he's seen something like that before. And that maybe, 
maybe Sawyer needs to kind of follow through with finding the boar and, and, you know, figure his situation out, which yet another example of Locke kind of setting people on a course to kind of figure themselves out on this island, which is interesting. Um, but anything, anything in those, in those sequences I'm missing there, Jay, anything that, that caught your attention? Um, yeah, there's a lot to, to, to get into here on this episode. Um, yeah, really disturbing seeing, you know, what Sawyer had to go through as such a young child and yeah, probably shows you why he's such a, you know, uh, odd guy, hard to talk to, you know, just just an odd guy. I mean, it just seems like he's an asshole for no reason most of the time. Yeah. But, um, uh, and then um, the whispering in the woods, he hears it, the same thing That's that right. Saeed had heard. And That's that was right. one of the mysteries that I wrote down was, you know, I know it can be in Saeed's episode also, but what are these whispers? One thing to note, and I don't know whether you heard it, the, so that he could hear the whispers and they're sort of, I, I don't know how detailed you want to get about loss and I don't know how good your sound system is, but if you were to like focus, like, because this is how this is how like Lost fans were doing it, the whispers are saying things. Mm-hmm. You can like fool with your audio track to kind of like focus on them to try to pull it out. Like, I think you need to know a little bit more about audio than I do to do it. But I do remember there were people who were like transcribing what the whispers say. But every now and again, the whispers will say something very like prominently. And in this one, the whisper sounded like the guy that Sawyer killed. I forget what he said. It comes like it comes around or something like that. Oh, we we heard that before we even saw that character introduced, right? That's right. Hmm. Right. Well, because by this point he's dead. We didn't we didn't find that out until right. you know the episode. But but right. So I just call that to your attention as interesting. I don't know. What you would make of that? But what did, you, did he say? Anything that you could understand, or you just thought that it was his voice? It was, it was just that quote, and I, I th- hold on, I, I can dig it up. What he act, what what the what the voice actually said? It's it's like one line. It's something like it comes around or something like that. It, it's I think it's it might be that thing he said, but be- he said to him before. Um, but. I I'll have to I'll have to dig that up. I should have I, when I was writing my notes I forgot to grab that one. Um, and uh, I said it was it's kind of stupid to think that now Kate is like an expert tracker, you know. But yeah, that, that's she went from yeah, right. She went from kind of maybe sorting hat sort of having a background. Oh, I was going to pay, is what he said. What do you think that's a reference to? Well, remember what Sawyer figures out is that Robert Patrick's character did like again, he knew that guy wasn't Sawyer, but he was a guy that that dude owed money to. And so he kind of sent Sawyer and made him think it was the real Sawyer so that Sawyer would kill him. Oh as punishment for him being like a guy, you know, again, he's like a, a loan shark or whatever the heck Robert Patrick was supposed to be. Um, and uh, that was it. I think it's just, I was going to pay. Cause like he, and in fact, I think he even says that as he's laying there like dying, he's like, I was going to pay him back or I was going to pay or something like that. He basically used him like a hitman. Yeah. Like you yep. get a free hit for him. And, uh, that's a good excellent. Um, the other major thing that occurs in this episode, I, I think it's major. We learn that Sawyer met Jack's dad, Christian, yeah. in a bar. That was that was a pretty big bombshell to me. And not only that, but it's it's a pretty emotional one because Christian tells Sawyer all about Jack without naming him. Um, but at the end of the episode, Sawyer has put the pieces together that that guy's son is Jack and it looked kind of like Sawyer was getting ready to tell Jack. Yeah. Met his dad. And then I can't remember if like Jack was kind of like a dick to him or what it was exactly. He ultimately doesn't tell him, 
Um, but that's that's like a pretty big, you know, call it a crossover, you know, pretty big relationship there. This is when I think I sent a message to you saying that I'm guessing that all of these characters are interconnected, you know, before the island. Um, because, you know, we see Sawyer in the police station when Boone's there um, in, in Australia. And we see mm. we see Jen in, in Jack's first uh, backstory episode, um, you know, where he's arguing to get his dad, uh, his dad's coffin on the plane. Yeah. You know, we, we see Jen there. So I'm seeing a pattern here where our other main characters are showing up. Yeah, there's starting to be connections there. That's right. The other that I would point out just in terms of timeline like when you were when we were watching it live it was a lot more like it was easier to kind of follow this stuff but Jack's dad makes the comment that's why the Red Sox will never oh, win the World Series. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Right and it should be noted that in real world time by the point they had, in fact, won the World they Series. Did. That year, they won it. That year, that's right. But in the timeline of the show, which would have been, you know, maybe a few days before September 22nd, I'm, I'm trying to remember the timeline there, but it was September 2004 when Sawyer met Christian, where he made this comment. Um, and it's just something that I would call your attention to. Um, that that comment about because the Red Sox won the World Series. Yeah, but uh, I mean I, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like doing the math, and I looked at the date this episode came out, and I'm like, that's I right. think they won in '04 because I'm not a huge baseball fan, but I kind of was at that time in my life. I mean, that was a, that was a great series watching the, yeah. the Red Sox win, and I actually that's became right. a Red Sox fan in the process. But um, yeah, what's probably, funny is. I think what's funny is that when I was watching Lost, like that's that, or when I was like when I saw it, like that's what I was thinking. I was like, "Oh wow, I wonder if Lost is ever going to deal with that." <laughs> so it's it's just an interesting connection. Almost like I mean, it was shot before, right? It was shot before they won the episode. Well, no, at that point, because I think they won in '04, so this would have been shot in. Um, I mean, it may have been shot in 04 or early 05, but because remember this, because it happened before them having Christian, like give that kind of comment, it still worked because they hadn't won anything yet. Right. Right. That's funny. And that may be why they did it just as kind of like a, a funny, like that he would say that knowing that in fact they do. Yeah. Um, they won because they crashed on the island. <laughs> any uh, any final thoughts about Outlaws? Um, let's see. No, I was just um, I was surprised, you know, that they had met each other, um, Jack and Sawyer, in the bar, and had a pretty detailed conversation. And, well, Christian and, and Sawyer. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's what I meant. Um, but, uh, you know, at first, uh, Sawyer goes to get some, like, a shrimp, some sort of shrimp meal from this guy's, like, truck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the guy that he thinks is the, the real Sawyer. Right. And, uh, you know, to get kind of chickens out. And that's kind of what I what I thought the character of Sawyer would do. I don't, you know, he doesn't come off as, like, a cold-blooded killer, you know? Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he comes off like a jerk, but not that. Um and I was kind of surprised when he went back and did it. And then when he found out, you know, not only did he do it, but he killed the wrong guy. Right. You know, it's, it's just really uh, got to screw somebody up emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. Sawyer's got some interesting, uh, some interesting stuff. A there. normal person that would screw up. Maybe not like a sociopath or something. But. <laughs> right. Um, so the next episode in translation as in Lost in translation, um, is a Jin flashback episode. And so we've had a Sun flashback where Jin figured into it, but now we have a Jin episode. And the Jin episode, in fact, sort of shows some things from Jin's point of view that we only kind of caught Sun's point of view, so we didn't have the full context for why it was happening. Like, at one point in Sun's episode, Jin ran into their house, and he's, like, covered in blood. Right. Cleaning up. 
And we were like, what the heck did he do? Like, what happened? Like, what's, what's going on there? So, a mysterious arsonist destroys Michael's raft, and everyone's suspicious, and everyone's suspicions turn to Jin, whose inability to defend himself prompts him to flee into the jungle. As the castaways hunt Jin down, Sun must decide the best way to protect her husband, even as she suspects that he may be guilty. Um, so that's actually been one thing we haven't talked about a ton, is that since the Michael episode, he has been working on building a raft, as he promised to. Uh -huh. um, and he, he got sort of far along, and then all of a sudden the thing starts, starts burning in the night. Um... And that's sort of a mystery just for this episode. Who burned the raft? Because at the end of the episode, it's kind of unclear to me how he knew, but Locke somehow figured out that, in fact, it's Walt who did it. He knows everything. Yeah, and it sounds like Walt kind of just wanted to stay on the island. Walt's uh, happy on the island. Right. Like, Walt kind of has a normal life. Like, oddly enough, he has a kind of more normal life now than he did back in Australia, back in Amsterdam, you know, wherever the heck his mom was carting him around to. I was surprised. I, I didn't I, I didn't even have an inkling that Walt could have done it. Right. Did, did you, do you, do you remember back when you first saw it? Did you? When I first saw it, like, I felt like Jin was so obvious that it couldn't be him. Yeah. I Maybe it was the 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 others, like Ethan's people. Yeah. Um, and in fact, doesn't I think Locke doesn't Locke have like a little speech where he talks about that in this episode, if I remember correctly, that he thinks the other that that you know the other people have done it. I'm not uh, sure. I don't, I don't remember that right off. You don't remember that, or maybe I'm. No, I'm sure you're right. I just, I yeah, it's like he's like he's like, listen, it's, it's like there's other people on this island, and we all know it, like that thing. Oh right, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, just kind of a nice little uh, again, another great Terry O'Quinn moment. The guy so, kicks, kicks butt even in other people's episodes. So basically, I mean, Jen. Before we were kind of like he's like a dangerous guy, you know. He's done some bad stuff, and now we learn that. I mean, yeah, he did beat the crap out of the, the guy, but he did it to save his life. You know, right, right. Like when you when you see that sun episode, you think he killed somebody. You think he did something terrible, and it's not like he didn't. But in fact, the whole story is he saved the dude's life. Sun's dad is a is a hooked up dude. He's like an automotive company titan guy in South Korea, and I forget what the guy did. I forget what it was. Like he didn't he screwed something up or whatever. And, and Jin was just supposed to kill him. Yeah. And Jin beat him up to send a message. As well, a he, he first just took his sharp A. Um, right. His dog. You're right. <laughs> we find that's out right. Which is the, yeah. That's a cute dog that he gifted to some, uh, I think in her episode. So it's interesting to get the backstory on that. Um, very disappointed, so I don't know what he could have. He could have done a lot of things to be very disappointed. I have a, I have a question for you in this episode. Okay. When Jin was at that guy's house, uh, his name is Byung, Byung Han. Could be butchering his name, but but when he was at that dude's house, did you happen to notice anybody on the TV in the background? Oh, I didn't. If you if you had noticed someone on the TV, you would have seen Hurley. Oh, okay. Right. Talk about the lottery win. Uh, yeah. That's, in fact, I think that's what it is. I think it's like him for that. So we're jumping ahead there. In terms How did of I miss that? I, like I told you, man, you got to be eagle-eyed. You got to watch all that stuff, especially in the flashbacks. That's where, that's where some of that stuff happens. Um, the other part of this episode, it's always been, it's always something I remember as just being like, I always like it. Just, I think it's a nice touch. But several episodes of Lost have ended with these sort of nice musical montages and like it's you know Hurley listening to his CD player. At the end of this episode, his CD player finally ran out of batteries. And oh. so musical montage just like abruptly stops and it's just kind of Hurley like sitting there and goes like, ah, crap or something like that, which I don't know that maybe it's a meta thing, but I just sort of find that funny. Yeah. Um, 
one thing I want to mention about Jen. Oh, sure, go ahead. At one point, Jen tells son's dad that his, his father is, is dead. Right. And we get we meet his father, you know, later on in the episode. You think he does that because he's ashamed that his father is just a fisherman? Yeah, I do. I think that I think that that probably because if you think about it, he you know he goes to his father, and what what's interesting about that is, by the way, is what has Jin been doing this entire time he's been on the island? Fishing, fishing, and he's the only one who can catch anything. Yep. So it's just this to me. It's this interesting thing where Jin was kind of trying to hide that, you know, maybe ashamed of it. You know, because Sun clearly comes from a powerful family. You know, the, there might be some of those dynamics involved in, in kind of their relationship that, you know, he felt like he needed to pretend to be someone that maybe he wasn't. But it's just interesting to me that the, the trade his father taught him is, you know, like saving his life now. Like I, So I've always thought – and that's true. The, the scene with his father I think is actually um, quite quite touching. Like the guy – the actor who plays his father – it's just a, a really good, you know, he kind of plays that father really well. Like a super nice guy, man. He's totally supportive and everything that he's doing. And yeah, you know, it's exactly what you want in a father. But um, exactly. back to your point about the fishing, like, I think it, it's becoming apparent that we've got like the perfect storm of like skills, uh, skill sets to like live on an island. Like, we've got the master, you know, uh, um, I don't know. You, nature guy like Locke, you know, he knows yeah. he knows how to make glue. He knows how to do this, that, and the other. And yeah. got Jack, they have a doctor, you know, yeah. who knows how to do everything in the world. You know, we've got the, you know, perfect fisherman. I don't know. We've got sons great at gardening, you know, and like yeah. everyone has a skill they're bringing to the table here. So yeah, it's becoming apparent that, you know, you know, everyone has a, a, a talent, I guess. Right. Right. It's um, it the one th like I always think about myself in that situation. Like I don't know what the heck I'd do on Lost Island. Like I'm a total. Uh, I would not be doing. Rough, <laughs> yeah, roughing it is not exactly my uh, my strong suit. I mean, I might could catch some fish or something, but hell, what are you even going to use? I mean, you know, right? Use a piece of the fuselage, you know. I mean, the, right. All that seemed to have, you know, right. I think I'd be trying to catch a fish like uh, like Charlie and, and Hurley did in that in that one episode where like they they like fashioned a spear, yeah. and they're, like trying to stab the water. Like I thought that was pretty. That was a good scene. I'm, just, I'm constantly like like I watched uh, Castaway a couple months ago with my kids, and I'm constantly going over Castaway. Like I'm like oh, okay, yes, yeah. so they would do this and they would do that. But yeah. I noticed, man, uh, it was um, Claire was in one of the later episodes. I mean, she looks beautiful. She obviously has makeup on, man. Come on, you know. Yeah, I remember what my wife looked like in uh, in third trimester. Beautiful, but but you know, like Claire is Claire is in her third trimester on a hot tropical island, uh, in the sun all day. Yeah, always like sparkling. <laughs> like she, like literally, her skin is like reflecting the sun. <laughs> She's okay with it all, you know. She's not. Yeah, like, she's fine. She's not complaining about yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Any final that. thoughts on uh, in translation? Got to suspend some disbelief there. Um, oh, on Claire, yeah. Oh, I mean, on you know, like you were saying, you know, how are the ladies shaving their legs and stuff? Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, Shannon and Saeed um, finally you know, hook up. That's true. The development. The Shannon Saeed relationship continues. That's no true. surprise there. Yeah, but you know, it kind of sets it up because she's not around when. Well, I will get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, I would also note that because the Walt mystery, the sorry, the Raft mystery gets solved by the end. I don't recall there being really any new mysteries introduced in this episode. Am I missing something? I don't think I had anything new until uh, the. Well, no. No, I don't have anything. Uh, okay. I, did, I did have some Sawyer nicknames in this episode, though. Oh, did you? Okay, because I have some for some of the other episodes, but not that one. What do you got for this one? Okay, these are pretty funny and, and racist. But, um, okay, Jen, he calls Bruce. 
That's right. <laughs> and, right. Uh, son, he calls Betty. That's right. That's right. I forgot. I, I I missed those in that episode. I have some for the next one, and I think the one after that or something. But uh, yeah, we got to keep an eye on Sawyer nicknames. Bruce sure. Bruce really cracked me up. Yeah. Um, of course, you would call him that. Yeah. Oh, he's got. <laughs> I've never said his his real name before. It's always something. Yeah, yeah he's like he, there are certain people that it takes a long time before he's actually calling them their name. He always has some wise ass uh, reference for them. Because I remember when he called uh, Shannon Sticks. I don't know why, but I always liked that name. Yeah. Carter, he's always like walking around with like the shortest skirt possible and like her long. Again, Maggie Grace has beautiful legs, so I can understand why they would do that. But um, good gams, as they'd say. Where they shot know. that too when they when they came up, they they like panned up her legs, and then he said it. You know. Yeah. So it was. It was, it was well done. <laughs> um. So the next episode. Numbers, written by David Fury and Brent Fletcher. David Fury, the architect of the wonderful walkabout. And um, I feel like I mentioned him. Which, one, which other good one did he do? Solitary. He did the Said episode as well. So David Fury, you know, architecting the backstories for um, some of our key characters. But anyway, Numbers. Michael begins building a new raft. He tells Jack that the chances of them being found while they're on the raft will be increased if they can send out a distress signal. With the transceiver needing new batteries, Hurley remembers Saeed mentioning that the French woman had batteries. He suggests that they try and find her. While searching for Rousseau's lair, Hurley discovers that the island may be linked to a secret from his own past. So, this is the, this is the Hurley flashback episode, and it reveals Hurley's big secret. He's a lottery winner. He, you know, he's won like 140, what is it, like $147 million or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. And um, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of money. And um, it this episode also tells us why Hurley was in Australia. And what's funny is Hurley is, is a character that's often played for laughs, but his kind of backstory has kind of a creepy bent it, which I think is, is interesting, which is that the numbers Hurley played in a lottery, which remember, I've been telling you, Jay, keep an eye on numbers. Right. And I, noted, oh, yeah. I actually right. noted some in some episodes. I, got him. I sent yeah, you my, um, uh, my screenshot of my. Uh, that's right. That's or, right. You did. A, a picture of my uh, trying to decipher. Uh, was I right on any of that? I mean, was, was, does, the, does, does the 815 have anything? Uh, well, 8 and 15 are two of the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, um, so eight or sorry, four, eight, 15, 16, 23, 42 are the numbers that Hurley played on his lottery ticket, which is what won him, you know, hundred, you know, hundred million dollars. And it turns out Hurley got those numbers from someone he met while he was in a uh, mental care facility, the Santa Rosa Mental Hospital. He, he got them from a guy named Leonard. He used to play Connect Four, Four, um, and Leonard got them from a guy. And I forget the guy's name now. All of a sudden, someone he had served with in the Navy, who heard the numbers just on a broadcast in the Pacific Ocean. Four, eight, fifteen, sixteen, twenty-three, forty-two. <clears throat> um, and Hurley is convinced that these numbers are cursed because once he wins, like his mom breaks his ankle, his uh, grandfather died, his like brother like, went away or something. He, he moved away because his wife left him for a waitress. That's right. That's right. He moved away because his wife left him. Um, grandfather and, died. His mom his breaks her ankle. His house catches the, the house he just bought catches on fire. Yeah, the house he's buying. His mom caught fire uh, while he's being shown. Oh yeah. He he had just bought. Interestingly, he his accountant is telling him about how he just bought. He's at he's at a place. He bought a box company in Tustin. Does that sound familiar to you, Jay? No. Where does Locke work? 
Oh, shit. Yep. So Hurley bought the box company. He owns that company. Hurley owns that company. Hurley owns that company. And then while he's being shown the building, somebody jumps off the roof and commits suicide. And then Every of course, it says, oh, they're, no, that number, those numbers aren't cursed. And, ah. Right. Yeah. And then, and also, by the way, Hurley was on a plane crash. So Hurley is convinced that the numbers are cursed. He's bad luck. He's in Australia because he's hunting down the guy who told Leonard in the insane asylum about the numbers. And so he meets the guy's wife who kind of tells Hurley where he heard the numbers and that gives him the background. But the guy's wife, by the way, kind of tries to set Hurley straight and says, hey, listen, my husband made choices. These numbers aren't cursed. Things just happen. Like you're, you know, you're working up the wrong tree, dude. But um, that's, that is Hurley's kind of backstory that we learn in this episode. Well, he he asked, uh, well, well, did he ever make it to stop? He said, yeah, he put a shotgun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. <laughs> wow. Yes. Um, but the on Island story, Hurley basically takes it upon himself to track down the French woman because on her writings, Rousseau, like the, so Saeed and Shannon have been kind of, that's sort of how Saeed and Shannon started falling in love, getting together. They were working on the papers that Saeed had taken from her, her hovel, uh, trying to decrypt them and see what's going on. Hurley notices on her notes, she has 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, and 42 on it. And so Hurley freaks out and wants to go charging into the jungle to find her to get, uh, ostensibly to get the battery that they're looking for to power the antenna for the raft that Michael's looking for. But, you know, really, he wants to ask her about the numbers. And Rousseau explains a similar story to what um, the, the dude in Australia encountered. She heard them on a broadcast in the Pacific, and that's actually how her boat crashed on the island, is they were trying to, like, figure out where that broadcast was coming from, and that's what was broadcasting at the radio tower before she recorded her message. Wow. So it's like those numbers bring people to that island. I I mean, it's it's an interesting... Like, you know, certainly there, there's something going on with those numbers, to be sure. Um, the other thing... Oh, also, just kind of some connections with previous episodes. If you remember, Walt is very good at backgammon, which may or may not be due to the fact that he's special and seems to have, you know, superpowers. But if you remember, he, you know, he yelled at Hurley. He's like, hey, wait a second, you owe me $22,000. And Hurley's like, I'm good for it. At the time, we probably just thought, like, oh, he's joking. Yeah. In fact, no, Hurley can pay Walt all the money he owes him for losing at that game. Um, did the Lotto girl look familiar at all to you, Jay? The one who announces the numbers. Oh, man, not, not that I'm aware of. She should have, because that was the girl Sawyer was bringing into the hotel room when Robert Patrick interrupted them. That's the same character. She was the lotto girl. And then this is not an in-show connection, but just of interest. That's Brittany Perrineau mm -hmm. to Harold Perrineau, a.k.a. Michael Dawson. In real life. <laughs> That's his real life wife, yes. Or at least was at the time. I don't know if they're still married. But still married, man. I, yeah, I looked it up. Um, I've been married for like 20-something years, too. Oh geez, yeah. Their daughter him. was in the uh, Jen and the Holograms movie. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you remember that bomb a couple years ago. Um, yes, yes, I do. What's funny is my wife likes that kind of stuff, but I was like, yeah, I don't think you should see that. Um, there's actually a very funny Sawyer nickname in this one. Did you write that one down? Short round. Yes, he calls Walt Short Round. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that was a good one. That's one of my the younger people may not recognize that uh you know that 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 reference. Yes, so for for the for the youngins in the audience, uh, short round was Indiana Jones sidekick in uh Temple of Doom. 
Um, so this episode actually did bring up, there's some mysteries. We've sort of been talking about them generally, but I wrote them down. Um, just a note, Rousseau mentions the, she mentions Black Rock again. The hell is Black Rock? Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of just wrote generally, what is the deal with the numbers? And then three, perhaps most interesting, at the very end of the episode, in a very x file Zinian creepy closing shot, we find out those numbers are stamped on the hatch that Block and Boone have been digging up. So, ooh. <laughs> any other, were, were there any other mysteries there that, uh, that I missed or anything that, that you're wondering about? No, I was the same. I just wrote down the, uh, the numbers. You know, what's up with these numbers? Um, Leonard said, you opened the box. Yeah. I wonder what that refers to. Well, I, it's interesting. I don't know. Do keep in mind, though, as much as I would question, I, I don't know that I would take everything Leonard says at face value. Would be. He, he is a mental institution. Leonard's not well. Yes. So that is interesting, and it was a creepy moment, but I, can you take everything he says at face value? And I'm just going to – that's all I'll say about that. I'll, I'll throw that out there. No, that's pretty much all I got. I think this was my favorite episode out of the bunch. Um, interesting. Just to, okay. I, I, I really am uh, – enjoying uh, Hurley's character as I forgot to mention in the uh, one of the previous episodes um, he tells Jack that he's like man Charlie's not not right he seems like he's got PTSD or something yeah. so I mean he really seems to genuinely care about people I mean he's right. a, a really a likable character that's right in fact it was kind of the other the other plot line in this where Charlie is still kind of I mean he, he acts like he's justified in doing it, but he's clearly been a little bit marked by, you know, shooting Ethan dead in cold blood. Um, like he's still sort of kind of getting right with that. And it's not a major thing in the episode, but it's definitely something Hurley notices and, and they, you know, try to well, kind of deal with that. When they're in the woods, um, Hurley is about to tell him, you know, the, the old, you know, I won the lottery and this, that, and the other, and I'm going to find this woman because of the numbers, but yeah. uh, Danielle is shooting at them. So to kind of stops that conversation <laughs> Right. And later on, Charlie, you know, tells him that, you know, I used to be on heroin, you know, I've been doing, going through heroin withdrawals. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, that's a pretty big load. I just shared with you, man. You want to tell me anything? And, yeah, like I'm worth 150 million dollars or whatever back home. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Come on, man." Yeah, her, Charlie doesn't believe him. You're just you're just telling he's jokes. Like, um, doesn't he say something like I, he, he like he says like, "Oh, okay," like and I'm Mick Jagger or something like that. He he has like a funny answer response to that. <laughs> um, actually, I guess there would be another mystery to think about because I, I actually just thought of it. Who built the bridge? Remember the bridge that Hurley storms across and then collapses. Yep. I mean, I, I guess just, you know, chalk that up with who, who were the other people on the island. Right. Right. Um, all right. Anything about numbers? I think that's it. I just think it, uh, it was, it was funny. Even the, uh, the, uh, the priest got struck by lightning at, uh, that his grandfather's funeral. Right. Yeah. I love all the bad things that happened to him. Right. It's like, hey, mom, here's your new house. And then she breaks her ankle and then the house is on fire. Then he gets arrested. Right. For, like they think he's a drug dealer or something. Right. And he so, looks really like, like from that period of time, he looks like a, uh, I don't know, like a, a rapper wannabe type guy. You know, he's got yeah. the big armor and the chains and he's got like yeah. a chop suit on. <laughs> yeah, I love I love how they're sort of like poor people rich. Like they're by a bunch of right. stuff. Right. Um, so the next episode is notable for a number of reasons. A, it is another lock episode, Deus Ex Machina. 
But it was the first episode of Lost, the first of many to come, co-authored by Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof. Locke and Boone attempt to open up the hatch using their latest invention. Back at the camp, Sawyer is suffering from headaches and asks Jack for his medical opinion on what might be causing them. While in the jungle, Boone and Locke make a surprise discovery, which has tragic consequences for one of them. So, um, first and foremost, I actually think like Locke builds up as a which I think is really cool. <laughs> um, it doesn't work in opening the hatch. Uh, I th I always thought that was really cool that like Locke builds this whole contraption. Yeah, what does he call it? It's a trebuchet. Trebuchet. <laughs> And uh, Boone says, I couldn't even spell trebuchet. And he's like, there's right. a T on the end. Yeah. Um, but when the trebuchet doesn't work and it comes apart, like it injures Locke's leg, and he seemingly is losing his ability to walk. And Locke is starting to feel like the, you know, Locke, Locke seems to feel like he has some connection with the island. And then, and so he he also then feels that if he's not if he's if he seems like he's losing the ability to walk, that maybe the island is somehow punishing him by by taking back what it gave him. Or again, this is I think Locke's perspective. I think that's I'm sort of articulating what I think he's thinking is going on. But so, um, at one point, doesn't he say the island will tell us what to do? He yes, tells that to he says that they kind of. You know, blurts it out. I don't think he intends on telling him that, but right, he didn't. Like, he didn't what? mean to sort of reveal yeah. the extent to which he like. Locke sort of kept it under under wraps, like what he really thinks is going on, and he's starting to let it out because he's frustrated and he you know trying to figure this stuff out. Um, but this is a Locke centric episode, and like we talked about, first off, guest stars. Kevin Ty of Roadhouse and Susie Kurtz are um, in the episode, the two notable guest stars. Susie Kurtz plays Locke's mom. Kevin Ty plays Anthony Cooper, Locke's real dad. Um, and this episode, no matter how many times I see it, like, I, again, I said at the beginning, but it just breaks my heart every time. Like, essentially what happens is Locke's dad... Well, we can talk about it, I guess, from the third person perspective since we know, but, you know, Locke seems to feel like his mom just sort of finds him. And then he looks into his mom and finds his dad. Mm -hmm. He develops a relationship with him. And then he finds out his dad needs a kidney because he, he's old and whatever. And after, and he volunteers his kidney. He doesn't want his dad to die. But after the procedure, Locke learns that, like, his dad, his dad just disappears. Yeah. And he goes to his house, and he's not allowed in anymore. And it's, you know, that music, by the way, like, you sort of get the full John Locke theme. Like, it's just heartbreaking. It's like Locke is beginning to realize what's just happened. His dad has conned him to steal his kidney. And doesn't want anything to do with him. That was all he wanted. And as he's driving away, he's like sobbing and slamming the car. And just, it's, 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 again, just a truly sad, heartbreaking episode. And just another layer of like John Locke's pathos. Um, you know. Yeah. I mean, as a viewer, we, we saw that coming a mile away too, you know. That, you know, his dad was just using him. Or at least I did. I didn't. I don't think until I, I actually my my first watch of it. I actually think I I was so kind of invested in it in like the relationship with his dad. I actually I think I actually thought his dad was going to die. I thought that's where that was leading. And then I think only when they were in the hospital and he woke up and he wasn't there that I was like. Oh shit! So like I, you're clearly ahead of me, but well, one of the reasons I may I may think that is because I know it may have been early on in this episode or the previous episode. Uh, Walt asked about his dad. He said, "Was your dad a good man?" And he just says, "No, no, he wasn't." Um, I think it actually was a different episode. Actually, did I write it down? I can't remember writing down that episode. 
Um, yeah, John, when Walt asked John Locke if his father was cool, John said, no, he's not. Okay. And in this episode, we found out why he would say that. You know what? That's great, Jay. You pick it up on that. I must have, maybe when I was first watching, I didn't catch that little exchange between Locke and Walt, or maybe I just got so pulled, you know, drawn up in the episode. I just, but that's interesting. When he was when he walked in on him doing dialysis, I, I immediately knew what what was going to happen. I knew he was going to give him a kidney, and then he was going to, you know, not uh, not want to be associated with him. I kind oh, of man. assumed that wasn't even his real dad, honestly. But and then his mom comes and tells him that uh, it was it was your father's idea or something like that, and they're not supposed well, to be in contact with each other anymore. Well, I think I think it has to be proof that he's really his dad because that's why he wanted his kidney. He knew right. that he would right. work, right? That makes sense, yeah. Um, but there's a lot like there's a lot of stuff that happens in this episode. So also let me call it some numbers for you. Locke was in his wheelchair for four years. Oh. He did the shopper at the store to aisles eight and fifteen. Those are the numbers I took uh, I took special note of. Um but uh, so on island, though, there was a bunch of other stuff that uh, that happened. For one, j- just briefly well, before we get into the really kind of big monumental stuff, <clears throat> Sawyer's headaches and farsightedness have actually been teased for a little while now. And I don't know whether you picked up on that, because if you remember when they were building the raft, Sawyer was like yelling at, at Michael and, and Jin, like, hey, cut me, can we cut out that racket? And he seemed like he was uncomfortable. And they didn't really linger on it for too long. But I think there was even something further back. Like, I mean, this actually maybe even goes back right to the beginning of the show. Because if you remember, he was able to shoot the polar bear, but he was, like, standing right in front of the marshal, and he missed. Like, he missed what he was aiming at. Um, So, I mean, if you really want to take it back, you could go all the way back then. But, yeah, there have been clues all along about – Sawyer having some some issues in this episode. We learn like he needs glasses. Um, again, not a major thing, but just interesting to see that they've been kind of laying that seed for a little while. That was pretty funny. I think because in so- Sawyer thinks he has a brain tumor. I think right. Right, like that's what he. Yeah, that was sort of his thought. Is that that's why he's see, after he's kind of a jerk to begin with with uh, with Jack. Jack like leaves. And he goes and he says, "Well, you know, Doc would would you know uh, the sensitivity to sunlight is that a bad thing?" Oh yeah, and then Jack's like, "Well, you like you might you might need glasses, or you might have a brain tumor." <laughs> Jack, Jack's kind of screwing with him the whole time, which yeah. I think is hilarious. Like he's asking him all these questions. Like, oh yeah, he's asking if he's had like sexually transmitted disease. Have you ever had an STD? Have you ever been with a prostitute? And he's like, "I'll take." <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good. Basically, I, it's funny because Jack doesn't seem to have much of a sense of humor, but there are some times where it's like he gets the opportunity to let it to let it fly, and I like when he does it. I kind of thought it was like to show Claire what a degenerate this guy is, you know? Yeah. Because I think Claire kind of. I mean, I mean, oh, I don't know. Kate. If it's true or not. I mean, Kate. I'm sorry. Damn yeah. it! I, was, I had that set up and I said it wrong anyway. No, nah, um, you're good. But uh, I think she. I mean, she does seem to be flirting with Sawyer sometimes, right? I mean, I would cert like so. If you remember when Kate and and Sawyer kissed back when he was getting tortured, uh-huh. yeah, he kind of he goaded her into that. But I don't know, man. Like I saw more than one tongue flinging around there, and I don't think if you're being forced to kiss someone that like you start slipping tongue in there. Yeah. She just had to kiss him to get the thing. Like, I think she could have done it without that. So, and again, well, it was it was kiss, not like make out, you know. Like, right, kiss. and they kind of did. Yeah. She she clearly there's something like there there's a relationship there that you know maybe it's maybe they maybe she feels a kinship to him. I mean, the, the never have I ever game yeah. from the episode. Like, clearly these two have a connection. So, yeah, there's something going on there. I, w- I would note for you, just, again, context. I, I did talk about, you know, when we were talking about doing the show, context, there's a, in, in like, the, the culture, there was a love triangle. It, like, Jack, is, is Kate going to choose Jack or Sawyer? 
Like that was the, that was always what the articles were about. And they had uh, it was it was like Jate or it was like Skate. You know, they would, uh-huh. you know that that stupid crap. Um, and so yeah, so I, I like I can because that was. At this point, that was all in like the entertainment news. Like that was what they would talk about in specific episodes. Like, oh, was like Kate closer to Sawyer this episode, or closer to Jack, and what's going on? So yeah, you're not you're not missing anything there. I was just saying. I mean, they, they obviously are developing a friendship at the lead. You know, at the least, right, uh, right. So. But so let's. But we've but we've we've, we've delayed long enough. The big news in this episode is that well, there's 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 a few pieces of big news, but um, Locke is injured. He can't really walk, but the Locke, Locke, as you mentioned, Locke makes reference to like you know, the island will tell us what to do. It just so happens that the island seems to maybe because Locke has a dream where Boone is covered in blood, and he sees a plane crash. So they go looking for that plane. And what they discover is a beach craft had crashed on the island. They find the bodies of um, priests, people seemingly dressed as priests. One guy has a gold tooth. They have guns. And and Lucky Charlie, there are Virgin Mary statues that fell out of this plane. And what are they filled with, Jay? They're filled with heroin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yes. what I wrote down. I said Charlie would love to get, get a hold of these. Oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder what Charlie's going to think when he comes if he if he comes across that. Um, well, one thing I was thinking about was, couldn't you use that for some medicinal purpose? Like, I mean, heroin and like opiates, like they've got like you know, I mean, you you know, besides getting high, like you can actually like, yes, absolutely. I think um, I think that's absolutely something you could use that for. Yeah, absolutely. Like when Boone was dying, maybe they could have eased his pain with. Uh, yeah, if yeah, if they'd known about it, yeah, that's actually that's absolutely right. I, I would have brought it back with me, but I know the plane fell and everything. So yeah, I think it was sort of like I think Locke. Well, again, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it, but like Locke was clearly like not in the right headspace. Like he felt like like Locke's faith was shaken in this episode. He felt like he's been doing what what the island's been telling him to do. Right. But then he gets injured. The island seems to be taking away his his ability to walk. He can't get into the hatch, no matter what he tries. Um, and uh, and now and then, you know, the plane falls on Boone. So Boone, but but let here let, let's let's go in order though. So they find the plane. They find all these Virgin Mary statues. You know, clearly these guys were like drug runners or something. Um, and Locke can't climb up there. He can't walk. Boone helps him helps him there, but then Boone has to climb up and get into the plane. And I don't know. I hope. You, I wonder if you caught this, Jay. But Boone, like, there's a radio in the plane, and Boone gets on the plane. He tries making a broadcast, and he said, "Hey, we're the survivors of Oceanic Flight 815." I feel like I heard a response saying, yeah. "We're the survivors of Oceanic Flight 815." And oh, that's then, what it said. That's oh, what wow. it said. That's what came through. But then the plane shifted and it fell with Boone inside it. And uh, so we didn't really get to get to, to kind of get any resolution on that. But my point being, you know, then the, then the plane fell kind of on Boone with Boone in it. And um, Locke hustled him back to the camp. And again, all of this is very masterfully intercut with, kind of Locke making the discovery about his father in the past. And Locke goes to the hatch where he's banging on it. You know, he's like, it's like, again, it's like that whole scene, the whole thing just gives me chills to think about it. And I always love, I always think about like the way Terry O'Quinn delivers the line where he's like, I've done everything you've ever asked me. Why have you done this to me? Like the way, like, like that, that like break in his voice. Um, it always gets me. Um, but, but, Jay, a light turns on in the hatch. What's that about? So there are some mysteries in this episode. Uh, help, help me make sure I've captured them all. Where did that plane come from? Yeah, that's the one I had. Priests with guns running drugs crashed on this island? What's that about? 
didn't Locke say at one point the the money, the currency was Nicaraguan? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's true. He did find uh, Nigerian. Oh, Niger Nigerian. Okay. Yep. And then just an who, expert in everything. That's right. Yeah, he's very smart. Who answered Boone's broadcast? Yeah. And, and I wrote the quote: "We're the survivors of Oceanic Flight 15." I didn't hear that. I don't know why I didn't hear that. I go. I pro this is not a spoiler. I promise. Go back and listen carefully. That's what I mean. Heck, even maybe turn on your clothes. I think it actually might come through in that. Yeah, but I normally have it on too. That's what the response is. And then, what the hell's going on here? Come on, <laughs> some sort of time loop or some sort of Doctor Who episode? Come on. I don't. I don't know, man. But uh, I. No, I, maybe when we get to the end of the season, I could. I, I actually no. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil no, it. I'm just you know spitballing. But, but yeah, but well, no, because it's just when. I, I could tell you that when this episode aired and that happened, there were people theorizing about what that was and and what they thought it was, or like who they thought it was. Because it had been like a theory throughout the season based on um, like the character. Nah. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. There there's a reason why people were theorizing what they were theorizing, and it's been you've seen it already. You you you've like again every episode you've seen like the the clues are there as to why people thought what they did, and they might have been right. Um, but the other thing would be then so, I mean I guess just generally why did the light turn on in the hatch? But you know there's a light in the hatch, you know someone or something's inside it, you know and maybe it was reacting to lock like. What's what is this hatch? Like, what's going on there? Ter Teresa falls up the stairs. Teresa falls down the stairs. Yeah, that well, that, that, well, that was. I, I think all that was was just a reference that Locke could use to get Boone to help him, because Locke could then ask him, "Well, who's Teresa?" And how would Locke know who Teresa is? But for yeah. this, was she a he, nanny? Or he said that. You yeah, know. he had a nanny who like fell down the stairs and broke her neck. Was what it was basically. And then she fell back up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I'm trying to think. Was there any more mysteries? Yeah, any mysteries or any other nicknames? No, I think that's all I have. Anything else on this one from you? I think that's pretty much it. Let me check. Um. No, that's it. I pretty much covered it all already. Okay. So, the final episode of this bundle of episodes is called Do No Harm. It is yet another Jack-centric episode. This is Jack's third one in one season. Um, and technically, I mean, you could, you know, Jack had flashbacks on the plane, which, you know, every, you know, there were flashbacks covering everybody. Um... But like Jack, we've covered a lot of territory with Jack so far. So yeah, uh, just just noting that. But do no harm. Jock Lee Locke leaves the the seriously injured Boone at the caves, forcing Jack to take heroic measures to save Boone's life. Unaware that her brother's life hangs by a thread, Shannon spends the night on a beach with Saeed. As their relationship evolves, Boone's condition worsens. Jack's abilities are further put to the test as Claire goes into unexpected labor. So all kinds of shit happens in this episode in terms of plot points coming to a head, but um, the kind of the, the sort of the, 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 the main like A and B story here is Jack in the caves trying desperately to save Boone's life. And then the secondary thing being, out in the jungle, Claire goes into labor, and she's stuck without Jack because Jack can't leave, won't leave Boone, um, and so Claire's got Kate with her and uh, Charlie and Jim. Um, but there's also a Jack flashback episode, and Jack had mentioned, I think, in a previous episode he was married, and in this episode we meet Jack's wife, played by Julie Bowen of. Um, uh, modern family fame. Mm. But uh, 
And also, just a little connection. If you remember that little kid that was getting beaten up in um, Jack's first flashback episode, um, the the one where Jack's dad told him that you know he just doesn't have it. That one, that little kid was getting beaten up. That kid was Jack's best man. His childhood best friend was his best man. Argus. Just a little connection there. Not it's not super important. Argus. But. Christmas story. Yes. The bully yeah. in the Christmas story. Yeah. Um, but this episode was a pretty pure character episode. Like, there was no new mysteries introduced, or at least none that I could... I was going through some notes and just trying to remember and, and looking at some things. I don't think there were new mysteries introduced, but um, some numbers came up. Uh, I forget if Jack has eight beers. There's, somebody has eight beers. And Sarah's wearing a T-shirt that has two fours on it. Um, some good nicknames in this episode. Sawyer calls Jim Cato. And oh, Claire, I missed that one. That's great. Yeah, and Claire is Mamacita. Okay. Um, but but I mean, let's not bury the lead here. Like we 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 referenced it earlier, but Jack is not able to save Boom. Like the episode is pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, see, no matter how many times I watch it, that scene. Where lap or Jack like sets Boone's leg, like God, I cringe every time. Like the sound, the hell did they use for like the ADR on that? <laughs> like the or like the sound mix for that is just it's like sickening. Um, and then and then like Ian Sommerhalder is doing a kick, you know, just great acting job. Like the way he screams is just uh, it's just horrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is. It's, it's gut wrenching. Yeah, and, and it's also, it's interesting, too, because, like, the way, like, all kind of the castaways sort of rally around, like, Sun becomes, like, Jack's nurse. She's sort of helping him. You know, at one point, like, Kate has to, like, Sawyer, Sawyer pitches in, of all people. He gives all of his liquor to Kate to try and get yeah. to Jack so and like, clean the wounds and stuff, um, which she fucking breaks. Um, but that's where she stumbles into Claire. Um, uh, Michael. They, they, Michael and some other people bring like one of the plane doors in. Jack wants to use it basically to lop, lop uh, Boone's leg off because he realizes that Boone's leg is dead. There's just blood pooling there. He can't stop the bleeding. He thinks if he can take Boone's leg off, maybe he can save him. Um, it's just, it's kind of a, it's kind of a crit. Like Jack's giving Boone blood. <laughs> he's like yeah. taking blood out of his own arm while he's doing it. His own blood, yeah. Yeah, his own blood because he's uh, he's like O positive or whatever, um, or no, he's I think it was the AB. I think he was O negative. He's a, he's a universal donor, whatever he is. Um, it's a, it's a crazy crazy episode um, and and emotional. Like you know, the whole time like Jack is just trying his damnedest to save Boone. You know, literally giving him his blood. Sun's trying to keep him under control, um, and then at the end. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the episode, but like at the end, uh, Boone stops Jack from lopping his leg off and basically tells him. I actually, I actually wrote this down on the plane in the first episode. Jack made a promise to Rose on the plane; he was going to keep her company till her husband got back, and then Rose let him off the hook. Jack promised Boone that he would save him. And Boone lets him off the hook. So, and then in the flashback story, remember Jack's dad, not acting kind of like an asshole for a change, you know, is actually a source of comfort for Jack and tells him that like commitment is what drives him. Like that's what Jack lives for, but that he can't let go. And so kind of the thematic thread there being that these people have to let Jack out of his promises or else he can't let them go. Right. But, you know, also like the, the story, like the, the, the Jack marriage plot is pretty crazy. Like Jack, we learn Jack saved this woman, the woman he's marrying, like she was going to be paralyzed and he saved her. Um, and so you, you're kind of getting, you know, Jack, Jack's character is kind of spilling all over us here in this episode in terms of the kind of man he is. Again, annoying as hell sometimes to be sure, but like this is a dedicated dude who tries to do what he thinks the right is the right thing. Um, but you know, eventually, Boone. Yeah, we're, we're on an island in a cave, a 
a plane fell on Boone, uh, Jack can't save him. He dies. Our first main cast member off the board. What uh, what were sort of your feelings about that? It was rough, man. I like Boone. Boone, Boone is one of those characters that's like, there's really not a whole lot to not like about the guy. I mean, yeah. He may be a little controlling of Shannon, but I mean, that's about it. I mean, otherwise, he's always been the guy to come in and help and, you know, try his best. Right. Just really, really sucks what happened to him. But yeah. It also makes you think that it happened for a reason, you know, because this island, you know, or at least Locke thought that, you know, whatever he needed was inside of that plane. You know, there was something special right. inside of that plane. Right. And it got. Boone killed, um, but yeah, I don't know. It was it was rough for me, man. It, uh, yeah, you the the music that plays, by the way, and I, I I haven't been doing as good a job of this as I have intended to, but I, I maybe you've been listening and catching some of the themes that keep popping up for people. But this was the first full blown arrangement of kind of the lost sad music. Like that do 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 do. I would not. I would suggest to you you may hear that again. Yeah. That's that's an arrangement that 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 may recur. Um. But yeah, it's, and, and you know, Boone too. I think kind of a conduit into lock too, right? Like Boone. Boone's kind of a normal guy. Like he's trying to do the right thing. Again, a little weird with his sister, but. He starts palling around with Locke because he feels like Locke's doing something important. Locke treats it like if, – if you, if you think about it, Locke has done for a lot of people this thing where like Walt – Michael never listened to him. Locke empowered Walt. Like Locke was trying to show him stuff. Locke treated him like a person. With Boone too, like Jack was always kind of like, hey, you're in the way. You're not really helping. You got yeah. that killed when you were swimming. You know, Locke's like, no, man, you have a purpose on this island. Like, help me. Like, let's do this stuff. And brought him along almost like an apprentice. Mm -hmm. Now, that didn't work out for well for Boone in the end. But, like, it was just interesting to see see Boone's story in that yeah. light. Like, we got to we got to, got to know him. You know, he sort of humanized Locke a little bit. Uh, and, and, yeah, like the, the, the Shannon story – uh, is is now interesting because she's been largely defined by her relationship with Boom. Although, again, like she's been sort of branching out, getting into this story with Saeed. But um, it'll be interesting to see where that where that story goes. To be sure, but we cannot forget Jay how this episode ends with Jack marching off in search of John Locke because he thinks Locke murdered Boom. Yeah, yeah, uh, I forgot That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's our big cliffhanger. Um, and, uh, interesting. So what, uh, any, any final thoughts on, uh, on do no harm on, on Boone's Boone's swan song here? Man, when, when he, you know, it's like a, a, a slow motion of Jack walking to tell Shannon who's coming back from yeah. her romantic night with Saeed. Yeah. You know, that that's really more gut wrenching than when Boone actually died in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. Because like, and Maggie Grace plays that great. If you remember, she like, yes. she's like shaking her head and like backing up, which is kind of instinct that uh, there's something about that move. Like, I kind of have a personal connection to that. Like, I, I remember myself being affected by news one time, and I, my instinct was to kind of back away too. And so that's something that I think this really I connect to. It's like, what's the first sign? Is like. Uh not accept whatever the acceptance is, you know, uh, denial, denial, yeah, denial. Yeah. right. Um, um, but again, it's like in, in true, in true thematic fashion, like it's sort of like Boone dies. Claire finally had her baby. Yeah. So the baby was delivered. Okay. Claire's okay. That baby's here. Aaron and Boone, 44. Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, it's, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a sad one. Like my my wife always hates when Boone dies because I yeah. make I make watch the show with me. But she was a huge Boone fan. She always yeah. likes the skinny spindly those those skinny spindly dudes are always the people she seems to be attracted to. And let's face it, Ian Summerholder is a pretty handsome guy, so I, I guess I can understand. The island's dude. Everybody's a model, you know. I mean, 
The guy's yeah. back, bro. It's, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. Everyone's got that. one board ab, awesome. massive breasts. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, so, so with those six episodes, there are only, depending how you define it, there's really only three episodes left. But the, the season finale was kind of like a two hour deal. Um, so you get to, there are four episodes left. So the next four we will tackle. And it's the end of season one are the greater good born to run and Exodus parts one and two, but Exodus, that's the season finale for lost. Hey, can I say something else real quick? Um, you may, yes. About, um, about episode 20. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it shows that Jack did at one time have a decent relationship with his father, right? I mean, somewhat. Well, yeah, because I think in, in the timeline, like we've seen like all the most, uh, this episode was the first time we kind of dipped further back in time, right? Like the episodes we'd seen to, the, to this, pardon me, to this point were like pretty much like right, kind of like right before it was, Jack in Australia going to get his father. You know, his father's dead. He's going to get him. That's Jack's in Australia. The episode after that was Jack, like, why did Jack's dad go to Australia? What happened between them? And then you learned, you know, Jack basically turned him in. Like, hey, you were drunk performing surgery. You were killed. You know, this episode took, like, a bigger leap. I'm not sure. I'm sure there is some lost fan somewhere who's got, like, the timeline mapped out. But this is at least a couple few years before all that. So yeah, like Jack and his dad's relationship was not always, uh, you know, I mean, clearly he's had a complicated relationship with his dad. I mean, that's fair to say. Um, this is, this is a case where, yeah, like he and his dad um, actually seemed to be, seemed to be okay. And it was an example too, of like how his dad wasn't always like a, like a dick to him. Like he seemed right. to think like, Hey man, you're actually well suited for marriage. Like this is for you. You should do this. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a good call. One more mystery I was going to bring up. Um, as Boone died, he said, "Tell Shannon," and you know, then he died. So what was he going to say? Tell Shannon I love her. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, again, I, it's not my it's not my intent ever to spoil you on things but i think that's more dramatic license like right you we're never going to know what right Brian, right yeah, yeah i figured that mystery. much yeah it is a mystery but it's not one we ever will get solved right true true but that's a uh but yeah that's that's fair that is that was a mystery um and, it was a powerful yeah. episode and i think it was probably a good it was probably a good episode too to sort of show the audience like this island is dangerous. Like, not everybody's going to make it. Like, here, here's, a, here's a fan favorite character, a dude, you know, you know, people liked him, and he's dead. We didn't even make it out of the first season. Somebody's died already. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind going forward. Like, you know, who's, who, who's safe, who's not safe, that kind right. of thing. And, but, uh, uh, see, John Locke's legs weren't working, yet he was able to carry Boone all the way back to the cave. Well, I think I think they came back, or, or the, you know, the island gave them back, or maybe it was mental and he did it. I mean, if yeah. you remember, he, he was still kind of hobbling when, yeah. he brought, even when he showed up in the cave, like he's hobbling. I think it was kind of a case of, like, Locke manned up and just knew he had to get Boone to Jack and just, like, worked his way through it. Um, but, but yeah, that's a good point too. So we can look forward to more struggles of power between Locke and Jack. It would not be an unfair guess to think that there is conflict coming there to be sure. <laughs> Locke's uh, not a guy I want to tussle with. I don't think. I wouldn't uh, want to uh, get to no, a knife fight with old John Locke. No, I wouldn't think so either. But you know, Jack Jack's not you know Jack's kind of a young young buck. So, um, but you know, it's it's a good point. I like we'll we'll see how that how that goes. Um, but, 
But uh, yeah, I'm I'm really excited, Jay. I I I am excited. Sure. You are on the precipice of finishing the season, and I, there's a part of me I almost want to torture you. I almost want to go two weeks after we do the next show. Okay. Eat. We can do that. Sit on, sit on that finale. We can talk about it. We'll see. If you're really chomping at the bit, we can do it. But um, I, again, I say that more just out of uh, just because it's a hell of a finale. Uh, like you're gonna be, your instinct will be, well, shit. I'm watching the next one because you can yeah. do. That. <laughs> I could not do that, and many people could not do that originally, and so that's just. Um, I- I like not doing it because, you know, I don't know what in the world is coming next. So it's, it's yeah. you know, my whole opinion could change if I've seen that next episode. Yeah. It's, um, there's some good stuff coming. Like you, the, the way, the way the se- the, the season closes strongly, I think. And, um, I am definitely excited to hear your feedback as you're watching it over the next week. So yeah, final thoughts before we say goodnight, sir. I'm loving it, man. It's, uh, we're, we're opening more boxes than we're closing at this point. So I'm looking forward to maybe a little bit of closure, some form of closure coming up. Interesting. Yes. I think um, there, there could be some closure on some things, but you're exactly right that the, the boxes are opening and aren't exactly closing quickly yet, but um, there, there are answers. There are some answers coming to be sure. Uh, so. Don't tell me what I can't do. Yeah. No, that's that's by the way. And Jack said it too. Which was good. Walk about and then uh, in this episode as well. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, but remember, it wasn't because Locke said it again, but then Jack said it too. When Son was trying to tell him, you can't do that. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 I love that. Reoccurring. Yeah. yeah, That is a little bit of a reoccurring motif, which is always interesting when it pops up. Um, I was wondering if that had any uh, significance. It's it's kind of just a thing. Um, I, I mean, again, it is significant in the sense that it's kind of a theme. Uh, like, because this, if, if you think about it, like, do you, do you not find it interesting that, like, like again, his name is John Locke. The the French woman's name is Danielle Rousseau. These are both famous philosophers, right? Okay. There are there are themes being played with here and especially even the island about like, I think, I don't think it's unfair to say at this point that the island definitely seems to be a place where like, if you remember and Locke, Locke basically says it like, you know, our old lives are kind of behind us now, Mm -hmm. you know, we're on this island. This is a special place. So it kind of seems like there's some questions of like free will being played with here. And so it would seem to me like, don't tell me what I can't do. Is kind of like a an in dialogue way of, for that theme to resonate, like the characters sort of rebelling against the idea that there's some that they can't do something or they're restricted from making a choice. Um, but yeah, I am excited, man. I cannot wait. I, you better keep me. In, you know, let's keep in touch this week. Cool. I want to know if you get into it this weekend. I want to know. We could do it. We could do a show real quick. So you want to shoot done. for uh, for next week sometime? <laughs> if if you get them done, I, I don't. The thing is, is I want you to enjoy them. I don't want you to feel like you got to just mainline these episodes, and because it's good to watch them and try yeah. and catch details and do all that stuff. So you know, take them at your own pace. But I just I love I love doing this, with you, Jay. This is a fun time. If I'm into something, man, I can marathon the hell out of it. Honestly, well, I was gonna say like if we weren't doing this, like you'd probably be in like season three by now. Yeah, me, probably right? so. So that's. Um, that's I might be finished with the whole thing. Who knows? You, as I say, you, cause you're, you're a late night dude. Like sometimes you'll walk, like I, you know, we talk offline sometimes and, and you're like, you know, it's like two in the morning and it seems to me like yeah. you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm usually up pretty late. So yeah. All right. Well, Jay, thank you again for doing this with me. I'm having an awesome time. I hope, uh, I hope the people who, who tune in enjoy, enjoy the show as well and are following along. So uh, please, you know, if you have any questions, put those in the comments. You know, please subscribe to the channel. If you're not already subscribed, click that notification button so you know when we're going live. Um, And otherwise, yeah, if that works. Yes, apparently that's maybe not working, but but, uh, we can try and figure that out. Anyway, Jay, have a good evening. Folks, thank you for joining us.